As many of our subscribers know, Doc Holliday was a professional gambler who worked the saloon and gambling halls of the cattle and mining towns of the western frontier between 1873 and 1887. What subscribers might not know was that Holliday also suffered from debilitating pain caused by chronic tuberculosis infection. Doc Holliday arguably was the most intriguing and colorful characters of the Wild West era, and a review of his life, health, and pain problems provides a unique educational opportunity. It might surprise you, but this icon teaches us a great deal about pain. He could be the poster child of the prototype patient who has a chronic disease, eventually develops intractable pain, and knows he has a short time to live. It's rare that we have the opportunity to dissect and study the history of a pain patient from birth to death. Doc Holliday left us this gift. To be a better pain practitioner, watch about the instructive case of Doc Holliday. After studying his case, you will never approach a chronic pain patient quite the same way. John Henry Holliday was born August 14, 1851, into an aristocratic southern family in the tiny town of Griffin, Georgia. Holliday had a classical upbringing and was educated at the Valdosta Institute, a school for sons of southern gentlemen in Valdosta, Georgia. Besides math and science, he was taught Greek, Latin, and French. When Holliday was a boy, his uncle, John Stiles Holliday, doctor of medicine, who was a physician, gave him an 1851 Colt revolver, which he learned to use expertly. When he was a teenager, Holliday moved into his uncle's house, where a young mulatto servant named Sophie Walton taught him and his brother how to play cards. She taught them games called Up and Down the River and Put and Take, which were similar to the card game Pharaoh. She taught them how to count the cards in the deadwood pile and to remember which cards were yet unplayed. Holliday had an intensive competitive spirit, as well as a remarkable memory and mathematical ability. Holliday attended the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery in his late teens, earning his degree on March 1, 1872. He practiced dentistry in Georgia before moving, in 1873, to Dallas, where he became a dental partner with Dr. John Seeger. Within his first year of dental practice, Holliday started frequenting gambling establishments and found that gambling was more profitable and exciting than dentistry. Holliday got the nickname Doc from his friends and acquaintances in the gambling saloons, who preferred to call him Doc rather than Dr. John Holliday. The life of a professional gambler in the Western frontier was dangerous. Losing players were often inebriated, took umbrage, and were ready to fight. Along the way, Holliday had developed a reputation as a deadly gunfighter. His long-term notoriety primarily stems from his participation in the gunfight at the OK Corral, which took place in Tombstone, Arizona on October 26, 1881. Had it not been for this singular event, which lasted all of 30 seconds, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp likely would have died in obscurity. As it turned out, this gunfight has long captured the intrigue and fascination of the American public. Countless movies, books, articles, and songs have been written about it, which often makes telling fact from fiction difficult. Because so much has been written about Doc Holliday, much of it conflicting, it often is difficult to get a clear picture of his personal appearance, demeanor, and behavior. In his memoirs, Wyatt Earp described Holliday this way, he was a dentist whom necessity had made a gambler, a gentleman whom disease had made a frontier vagabond, a philosopher whom life had made a caustic wit, a long, lean, ash-blonde fellow nearly dead with consumption, and at the same time the most skillful gambler and the nerviest, speediest, deadliest man with a six-gun I ever knew. There is disagreement over which photos of Doc are legitimate. His true image has been dramatically altered in the many movies about him, so I have included a number of quotes by various persons in an attempt to capture the truth. Perhaps the best quote to separate fact from fiction is one by Bat Masterson, sheriff of Dodge City and Pueblo, Colorado, who personally knew Holiday. Considering Doc's tuberculosis, Masterson described him as a physical weakling who could not have whipped a healthy 15-year-old boy in a go-as-you-please fistfight. Contrast this with the number of robust actors Hollywood chose to play Doc, including Kirk Douglas, Jason Robards, Victor Mature, Cesar Romero, and Stacey Keach. Just how much his pain and health problems influenced his temperament and behavior will always be a matter of debate, but it appeared to this author to be paramount in shaping his short life. There is remarkable consistency among Doc's serious biographies regarding his health problems, which have allowed this author to medically analyze and report his case from a pain practice perspective. Holiday's health problems began at birth. He was born with a cleft lip and possibly a cleft palate. 
His lip was surgically repaired and the Holiday family took the time and effort to teach him to speak properly. Whether there was a genetic aspect to his birth defect will never be known. But it is commonly believed that genes and the environment play a role in the development of these orofacial clefts. The second major, but critical event in Holiday's life, was the death of his mother Alice from tuberculosis in 1866, when he was 15. He had been very close to his mother, because during many of his formative years his father was away fighting for the South in the Civil War. At the age of 21, while practicing dentistry in Georgia, Holiday started to lose weight. He initially attributed this to his active schedule. About six months later, in the summer of 1873, he developed a nagging cough that forced him to take some time off from his dental practice. When the cough did not subside, he sought out his uncle, Dr. John Stiles Holiday. Using a stethoscope and a bronchoscope, he diagnosed Holiday with pulmonary tuberculosis, which at the time was commonly called consumption or phthisis pulmonalis. Although the science of contagion was poorly understood at the time, the Holiday family believed his problems were somehow related to the tuberculosis that killed his mother. It was not until 1882 that Robert Koch, who already had identified the bacterial cause for anthrax, identified the tubercle bacillus as the agent responsible for tuberculosis. The treatment recommended by Holiday's uncle was that proffered by Dr. George Boddington and the renowned Dr. Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia. It consisted of a climate of warm, dry air combined with a nutritious diet, a moderate amount of wine, and prolonged rest during convalescence. Of course, Doc did not follow this advice completely, considering that he spent a great deal of his life staying up late and living in smoke-filled rooms. Of extreme importance is that Holiday was told if he remained in Georgia's hot and humid climate, he would live about six months, but he could extend this time to two years if he moved west to a drier, arid location. In other words, his hand was forced. He had no other choice but to move. On a hot and humid Atlanta day in September 1873, he boarded the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Destination? Dallas, Texas. There was no return ticket. He was met at the Dallas train depot by his dental partner, Dr. Seagar. Due to his consumption condition, which often brought about coughing episodes, as well as a long depression, he couldn't build much of a dental practice. Thus, he turned to the sporting life. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a total of 10,528 tuberculosis cases were reported in the United States in 2011. Both the number of tuberculosis cases reported and the case rate decreased compared to 2010, representing a decline of 5.8% and 6.4% respectively. This is the lowest recorded number since 1992, when the resurgence of tuberculosis peaked in the United States. The increase of tuberculosis predominantly has been seen among the foreign-born United States population. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that 62% of tuberculosis cases reported in 2011 occurred in foreign-born persons. The tuberculosis rate among foreign-born persons was approximately 11.5 times higher than among United States-born persons. Although less common today than during the mid to late 19th century, tuberculosis remains a horrible, painful disease. The disease may be acute or chronic, and generally attacks the respiratory tract, although other parts of the body, such as the brain, the kidneys, and the spine, may be affected. The symptoms are caused by the toxins produced by the infecting organism, which also cause the formation of characteristic nodes consisting of a packed mass of cells and dead tissue. In most cases today, tuberculosis is treatable and curable. Despite improvement in medical management, however, tuberculosis remains a deadly infectious disease. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that there were 529 deaths from tuberculosis in 2009, the most recent year for which these data are available. This represented a 10% decline compared to 2008. Another confounding factor today is the emergence of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis and extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, which leaves the weakest patients with very few treatment options. Pain from the disease comes as the tubercle bacilli invade nerve tissue. Additionally, Incessant coughing may cause fractured ribs, ruptured lung tissue and irritation of the phrenic, vagus, and intercostal nerves. The noted Western writer and historian Bob Bowes Bell gives a description of consumption in his 1994 book, The Illustrated Life and Times of Doc Holliday. It would be difficult to better describe untreated tuberculosis, so it is given here verbatim. Consumption can go undetected for some good time especially if the tendency towards denial is followed. 
Fatigue is more and more pronounced as one's appetite seems to disappear. One feels out of sorts and clammy. Periods of fever come and go. One wakes up in the dead of night drenched in sweat. In the morning, choking, coughing, and spitting up, at first watery fluid, later blood and chunks of lung tissue, rack the sufferer. The chest feels as if it were imploding, and the pain of it all leads many to alcohol for temporary respite. To crown it all, many thought the illness a result of moral laxity. Compounded with terror of contagion, the consumptive becomes something of a pariah, a lunger despised in and for his infirmity. As has been reported, Holiday was physically impaired by his consumption disease throughout his 14 years as a professional gambler on the western frontier. He could hardly fight with fisticuffs, so he apparently became the most deadly and feared gunman of the era. John Jacobs, a fellow gambler and casino operator, said of Doc, This fellow Holiday was a consumptive and a hard drinker, but neither liquor nor the bugs seemed to faze him. He could at times be the most genteel, affable chap you ever saw. And at other times he was sour and surly, and would just as soon cut your throat with a villainous-looking knife he always carried, or shoot you with a 41 caliber double-barreled Derringer he always kept in his vest pocket. Jacobs describes a volatile man who has exacerbations of intolerable pain, as well as mood swings and hostility. Doc Holliday lived until age 36, some 14 years longer than he was predicted to live. His major medicinal treatments were alcohol and opium. Additionally, he likely took bugleweed, a standard treatment for tuberculosis in the 1800s. For the cough and pain of tuberculosis, which is a disease of exacerbations and remissions, alcohol and opium were the only potent available treatments at the time. Much has been written about Doc's alcohol intake, including references to his being intoxicated at times and drinking up to four quarts of whiskey per day. He is called an alcoholic by several writers. There is another side, however, to their claims. His common-law companion, Kate Elder, reportedly said this about his alcohol intake. He was not a drunkard. He always had a bottle of whiskey but never drank habitually. When he needed a drink, he would take only a small one. Considering that he had to be alert to count cards, professionally gamble, accurately wield a gun and knife and ride a horse, it is difficult to believe that Doc spent much time being inebriated. It is quite likely that Holiday suppressed his coughing and pain with a daily maintenance dose of alcohol. For example, he likely knew that a certain daily dosage taken on a regular interval schedule kept him stable. Unfortunately, alcohol is difficult to manage as a medicine because it is a volatile compound, and Doc, like other pain patients who use it therapeutically, overdosed on occasion. Historians agree that Doc's health began to dramatically fail in about 1884. While working as a faro dealer in Leadville, Colorado, he began to deteriorate into what is called stage 2 tuberculosis. This stage is characterized by severe weight loss, mental confusion, extreme fatigue, and weakness. It was later discovered that tubercle bacilli like to invade the adrenal glands and produce symptoms of Addison's disease or adrenal failure. At one point in history, tuberculosis was the most common cause of adrenal failure. It was most likely the cause of Holiday's severe late-stage debilitation and his death. Today, with the waning of tuberculosis, autoimmune disease and iatrogenic corticoid administration are the major causes of adrenal insufficiency. A major problem in researching the pain and health problems of Doc Holliday is all the sensational biographies, semi-fiction books, and movies regarding the Wild West. They have distorted the image and behavior of Holiday and others. There have been, however, several serious attempts to write factual bibliographies about Holiday, and these serve as the primary basis for this treatise. One bibliography, Doc Holiday, A Family Portrait, is written by Karen Holiday Tanner, who was a distant cousin of Holiday and had access to many family records. Another, Doc Holiday. The Life and Legend, by Gary Roberts, was written with direct communication and advice from Holiday family descendants. Other bibliographies have been written by serious and renowned Western historians and academics. These authors have researched newspapers, court records, census rolls, and interviewed numerous people, leaving no stone unturned to piece together the history of the events and happenings of the 14 years that Holiday roamed the Western frontier. There are two excellent historical summaries of Doc Holliday as well as some on Kate Elder, that now are available online. Perhaps the best first-person account was written by Masterson, who wrote a series of articles on the gunman he knew when he was sheriff of Dodge City and Pueblo. In his later years, he retired from the western frontier and moved to the east to become a journalist and newspaper man. 
He published his articles in Human Life magazine in 1907. His collection of articles was republished in book form in 1957, and again in 2009 under the title, Famous Gunfighters of the Western Frontier. When Doc started to severely deteriorate, he began the regular use of the opium formulation called laudanum. Nearly all consumptives use some form of opium to quiet their cough, control diarrhea, reduce stress, and relieve the pain of tuberculosis. As he deteriorated, observers could see that Doc could no longer deal cards or work as a gambler. Consequently, he was unable to make much of a living and lived on odd jobs in Denver, Leadville, and Trinidad, Colorado. When Doc was really sinking, Leadville druggist Jay Miller provided Doc with laudanum at no charge. With his health failing, he checked himself into the Glenwood Hotel in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. When Doc was really sinking, Leadville druggist Jay Miller provided Doc with laudanum at no charge. With his health failing, he checked himself into the Glenwood Hotel in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. He had heard that the sulfur springs in the town might bring relief. This was not to be. He became bedridden, lapsed into a coma typical of tuberculosis patients, and died within a few weeks, on November 8, 1887. As noted, Doc used alcohol and opium to treat his symptoms of tuberculosis. Before you think this was a ridiculous notion, be aware that Dr. John Fothergill, regarded by many to be the world's most prominent physician in the late 1700s, recommended alcohol and opium for the management of tuberculosis. He wrote, Fresh white poppy seeds, in the proportions of half an ounce to a pint of Bristol, make an excellent emulsion. The cough will abate and gradually cease entirely. In today's world of high-powered pharmacology, it seems almost ludicrous to think of these two chemicals as a treatment. Be clearly advised, however, that Holiday didn't have any choice. Aspirin wasn't even invented until about 1895, some eight years after Doc died. There were no such things as antibiotics or neuropathic agents or antidepressants. The point to be made, particularly to those who believe pain is just a nuisance to endure, is that patients who have severe pain assuredly will take whatever medicinal agent is available, including alcohol and illicit drugs. Furthermore, they will incessantly harangue the medical system and even commit unsavory acts to obtain pain relief. In summary, it is pure ignorance and foolishness for any physician, regulator, and insurance payer to withhold adequate pain treatment with a cavalier, naive attitude that the patient should tough it out, or it's only psychological. Colonel John Devers reportedly asked Holiday about his life. Doctor, don't your conscience even trouble you? Doc replied, I coughed that up with my lungs long ago. Alcohol has been used for centuries as a pain reliever. During both the American Revolution in the 1700s and the Civil War in the 1800s, a soldier with an arm or leg that had to be amputated was given alcohol before the surgeon sawed off the appendage. Surveys today indicate that as many as 28% of people with chronic pain use alcohol as a pain management strategy. Out of a series of 401,512 urine specimens collected from pain patients throughout the United States, 28,086 contained ethyl sulfate, an alcohol metabolite, with levels indicating they had consumed more than 24 grams of alcohol the previous night. Doc's behavior indicates that he primarily used alcohol as a maintenance drug. Please recall, he was an accomplished gambler, gunfighter, and horseman. These feats are not compatible with intoxication. He likely kept alcohol in his blood pretty much throughout the 24-hour cycle to suppress his cough and pain. Holiday undoubtedly exceeded his alcohol maintenance blood level at times due to accident or intent, and consequently became intoxicated at times. Such is the problem when alcohol is used as a chronic pain treatment agent. The lesson here for pain practitioners is simple. If alternate, safer pain treatments are not provided, the pain patient may well resort to alcohol. The author once asked two Alcoholics Anonymous members who were patients in his pain clinic to survey their local support groups and find out how many drank to relieve their pain because they couldn't get adequate pain relief. The answer they gave, about 30% opium preparations for medicinal use date back 2,500 years. Various formulations, including a poppy head soaked in water, have gone under the names meconium, theriac, diascordium, mithridate, felonium, and diacodium. Laudanum is known today as tincture of opium. The laudanum formulation used in the 1800s contained not only opium but also wine, and was flavored with cinnamon or saffron. It was primarily used in Doc's time as a painkiller, sleep aid, and tranquilizer, just like modern-day prescription opioid preparations. 
Because laudanum could be taken orally, it was easily administered. Essentially, no other pain medication was available because morphine only was available as an injectable compound. Other opioids were not developed for oral pain treatment until some years after Doc's death. Opium was sold without a prescription, and it was a primary ingredient in the so-called patent medicines sold in the 19th century. Opium preparations contain small amounts of codeine, morphine, and other opioids. Regardless of what it is called, or which formulation has been historically used, opium has, in the words of the 16th century physician George Wolfgang Weddell, been a heaven-born gift. Opium was the standard treatment for tuberculosis throughout the 1800s. Unfortunately, we do not know the dosages and frequencies of alcohol and opium used by Doc Holliday. This is unfortunate, because he managed to live a considerable time, despite spending his days in smoke-filled rooms. There is some new evidence that opioids may suppress some infections and increase immunity in some patients. If this is the case, Doc Holliday may have extended his life with opium. When Doc was dying in Glenwood Springs, he asked Kate to come see him. It is not known, however, for how long she stayed or whether she was at his bedside when he died. Prior to this, they had split over her false accusations about the stagecoach robbery in Tombstone. In the end, however, they were reunited. She claims that among Doc's last words were, Well, I'm going just as I told them. The bugs would get me before the worms did. On the day of his death, his nursing attendant stated he woke up for a moment and asked for a drink of whiskey. He looked at his bare feet and said, This is funny. Apparently he expected to lose a gunfight somewhere along the way and die with his boots on. Pain practitioners seldom get to know a patient's history from birth to death. Doc Holliday gives us a most insightful opportunity to perform a pain history autopsy. Although death from tuberculosis has essentially disappeared from the American scene, we now have other chronic illnesses that may produce severe pain when the disease enters its late stages. When patients with these underlying diseases develop severe pain, they instinctively know that they may have a shortened lifespan. These patients now are prevalent in pain practices, and they need aggressive medical treatment lest they self-medicate with whatever agent they can grab, including alcohol and illegal drugs. Besides medication, these patients need our caring and counseling to find some happiness, contentment, and quality of life in whatever time they have left. Doc Holliday started his life as an accomplished health professional. I suspect he would be tickled to know that the study of his life, pain, and illness will help us to help other persons who now face the same challenges he faced.